Robert Bankin and Douglas Hurley arrived at Kennedy Space Center on Wednesday and are now less than one week away from becoming the first humans to launch to the space station from the United States since 2011. They're joining us from astronaut crew quarters and we have just 25 minutes with them, so we'll let them make brief remarks and then take questions. Participants on the phone can uh, press star one to let us know that you have a question and those watching from home can send theirs in on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. But first, let's hear from the crew. Bob and Doug. Hey, good afternoon from uh, Kennedy Space Center and crew quarters. Uh, just heard that uh, everything went well with the FRR. We're excited to still be on the countdown. Hopefully we'll see the uh, static fire here in a couple hours and we're ready to take your questions. All right, we are going to um, start off with Marina Korn from the Atlantic. Marina? The time. Hi, Bob and Doug. Um, very excited for you. Um, I'm wondering when you will see, for the last time before a launch, your families. Um, how will that be set up? Will they be wishing you well from a distance just to be safe? Uh, we certainly will be wishing our families well from a distance. Uh, as uh, folks know who've seen the uh, shuttle history of walkouts, uh, we'll be walking out of the astronaut crew quarters, um, making a stop in front of the uh, Tesla that will take us to the launch pad. And that will be the point where we get a chance to really see our families for the final time prior to launch. So we'll give them a wave and then we'll uh, head around and, and climb in the car. And there might be a chance for them to get up close next to the window, but, uh, but that'll be the last time that we see them before launch. Next, we'll take a question from Joey Roulette with Reuters. Kathy wrote to you from the station about seeing you and Bob in the coming days. Um, what else did he say in that email? Is he looking forward to you guys uh, going on the station? And for Bob, I was wondering if you could tell us about how it felt to fly over to Kennedy Space Center. What did you guys talk about while you were on that flight? Thanks so much. Uh, as far as the email from Chris, I, I probably would be doing him a disservice if I divulged everything he said in his email to us. But uh, he is, I think, very much, and, and knowing Chris, as both Bob and I know him pretty well, he's he likes solitude, but uh, it was very obvious that he is ready for some uh, some some human interaction with, uh, with us uh, as far as in the U.S. segment. Obviously, he's got his two Russian crewmates. But uh, I think he's looking very much forward to us coming up there and uh, at least uh, trying to help him out some. For, as far as our arrival goes, I think Doug and I were both extremely excited to return to the Kennedy Space Center and get a chance to fly around the facility a little bit. We didn't land immediately. Uh, there was always a, there are always timing issues that people are trying to have as a consideration as you come in for an event like that. So we did get a chance to make a little bit of a tour of the, the local area uh, rather than doing a full full stop straight in, which uh, allowed us to reminisce about all the times that uh, Doug and I have flown in here, both as Cape Crusaders, but as astronauts over the years, and certainly uh, dozens of times together uh, coming to work at the Kennedy Space Center. It just was an exciting thing to go through uh, one more time leading up to launch. It was exciting Thanks. to see. Next, we'll take Marsha Dunn from the Associated Press. And if so, will that continue right up until lunch day? And I'm also wondering if you've ever been so medically scrutinized in your entire lives. Um, the, the first part of your question got cut off. Uh, it sounded like you had, uh, were somewhere in the middle of saying the word quarantined. And that as far as, so I'll let you ask that as soon as I answer the second part there. Uh, this medical scrutiny, I think for us has, uh, other than um, maybe the uh, COVID testing, it has been like it normally is. It's we've always we've been scrutinized for 20 years, 20 plus years since we uh, interviewed for this job. So, and it seems like every year the scrutiny gets greater. Uh, so from that perspective, I think it's uh, it's been relatively normal, uh, comparatively speaking. And and we just I think uh, after all these years are just kind of used to the poking and prodding and blood draws and, and all the other things that come along with uh, flying into space. So what was the other part of your question, Marsha? Yes, I'm wondering if you're still being tested for COVID-19 and if that will continue right up until liftoff. 
Well, I think from a medical standpoint, I don't think uh, anybody recommends we get tested every day. We've been tested at least twice so far, and uh, rumor has it we might be tested again before we go. So um, I think in general, that seems like plenty, uh, especially considering we've been in, a, in, for all intents and purposes, a quarantine now since uh, about March 15th is, is my recollection. So I think that's... Uh, I think we're doing pretty good. So from that standpoint, we have been in quarantine probably longer than any other space uh, space crew has ever been in the history of the space program. Okay. Thanks so much. We've, been, we've just been really familiar with the quarantine process over the years as you know, active astronauts. We've seen it for ourselves and all of our, 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 our compadres who are inside the office, but uh, we've seen the rest of the world have to take on the same sort of precautions that we do uh, leading up to launch. and. Uh, uh, that's been a, a good thing in some sense for uh, for Doug and I. It has allowed the opportunity for us to spend some time with our, our young children who would have been below the age of uh, access, if you will, for a quarantine if, if they weren't home from school. And so uh, that's been uh, a little bit of a, a tiny bit of sli sliver of silver lining that we've had is the time with our sons leading up to this launch, which would have they would have not normally been inside of our quarantine. Next, we'll hear, we'll hear from Jackie Goddard with Times of London. Princess Badass, I suspect that if I ask each of you to elaborate on what makes you a badass, you'll, you'll be all modest and say you're not and that you're just doing your job. So I'd like to ask Bob, what makes Doug a badass? And Doug, what makes Bob one? Thanks, and have a safe flight. <laughs> Did you say that? I don't know. Brandy, can you can you repeat the question? <laughs> I'll let you rephrase. <laughs> no, I, I, it's a it's a it's a great question, and I, I figured out a way, and having us do it with, on each other is a is a good way to get us uh, through the gap there. But Doug is ready for anything all the time. He's always prepared, and uh, you know when you're going to fly into space on a test mission, that's uh, you couldn't ask for a, a better person or a, a better type of individual to be there with you. And so I'm just thankful that uh, doing something like this, I, I'm doing it with, uh, with uh, Doug Hurley because he's, he's going to be prepared for whatever comes our way, and he's going to be prepared, prepared quickly. So I, I, I couldn't ask for more. Yeah, as far as, far as Bob, you know, he is the uh, quiet, bad, uh, and then I'll let you put in the next word. Um, but he, he just doesn't, there's no stone unturned. There's no... Uh, no way that he he doesn't have every potential eventuality already thought about, uh, you know, five times ahead of almost anybody else. And so there's just, there's there's no question I can ask him that he doesn't already have probably the best answer for. And, and it's just been, you know, it, it's just such a, 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 just a pleasure. And it's, it's such a, you know, uh, an asset to have somebody like that on a on a crew with you that just it, he's already got it all figured out. Um, everything that we could possibly, you know, potentially deal with, and and it just it, it just makes it so much easier when you have somebody like that with your crew. Yeah, we're going to take both of us, I think, as we head to space station because I think, uh, of course, one of the Cassidy or the Navy SEALs mottos is, uh, you know, have a plan for every situation and uh, dispatch of it appropriately. And uh, so between the two of us, maybe we can keep up with Chris Cass. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take a question from Twitter now. Um, we have uh, Robert on Twitter who asked, uh, many of America's previous spacecrafts with crews uh, had names. Mercury 3 was Freedom 7 and Gemini 3 was called Molly Brown. Uh, do you, have you guys named your crew Dragon? We have. <laughs> we, okay, we have to save question. some suspense for the mission itself, but uh, we we do have a name, and we will uh, break it out appropriately, and and we'll uh, we've got something for you to look forward to on launch day. Yeah, this this goes along with kind of some of the traditions, and we we've, we've talked about this uh, many times, and and you know, not only. Uh, Bob and I, but uh, several other folks within our office and uh, the crew one and, and now the crew two folks uh, and certainly the folks on the Boeing side um, all think it's a great idea and a tradition we should continue. So we, we feel honored to continue this tradition. We will look forward to that for sure. 
Uh, and next on Twitter from Owen Plum, who is 13, uh, he wants to know, are you bringing any payloads with you? Any payloads? You know, for, for our mission, we really are focused on the flight test aspect of it. We do have uh, some small uh, items that are bring, they're coming up to the International Space Station, uh, but our primary responsibility is to get ourselves up there. And so the, the amount of payload activity that we have on board is pretty minimal. Uh, once we arrive at Space Station, I know that we'll be supporting operations associated with the HTB that uh, should be arriving soon after we do, uh, both for potentially spacewalks uh, as well as other experimental hardware that's inside of that vehicle. So we're primarily uh, crew transport, and uh, we've got some extra hardware that we'll leave behind on Space Station to facilitate future uh, Dragons arriving on the International Space Station. But our our payload uh, number, our play, payload mass is pretty limited. Okay, we'll go back to the phone now. This next question uh, will be from Chris Davenport with the Washington Post. Chris who? Yeah, well, I don't know if we've met him before. <laughs> Chris, are you on? Apparently he's not on. Okay, we need to go, I guess, to next to uh, Miriam Kramer with Axios. Hi there. Uh, thank you guys for doing this. So with this being a time of such great uncertainty for folks around the U.S., I just wonder what you hope this launch will mean to people as they watch it from their homes. Thanks. I think for both Doug and I, the thing that we most want to bring home is that uh, we are still able to do this and, and perform it safely. You know, COVID did uh, drive some changes in how we were conducting our operations and preparing for this mission. But we as a nation all across the nation, you know, folks from Florida through Texas, uh, both in Houston and at McGregor with the SpaceX team, as well as in California, had to figure out a way to still pull this mission off safely, still prepare for it safely, still work together uh, to accomplish it, even with all the constraints that, you know, really prevented the togetherness that we had been uh, exercising the previous five years. You know, we had spent a lot of time out in Hawthorne face-to-face -face with the team, and I know the, the Houston travelers had to figure out a way to not necessarily do that as often. And so I hope the, the nation can look at this and recognize that uh, this is something we're still going to accomplish. This is still something that we're going to still be successful at, and we're going to do it in the face of, uh, you know, the pandemic. We'll figure out a way to, to work through it and work around it and work through it safely. So. Uh, we mentioned already that we'll continue to be COVID tested as we lead up to launch because we, of course, don't want to take that to the International Space Station. But, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, and there's been will to make this happen, and we're just proud to be a part of it. Next up, we'll go to Lucas from SpaceX. Hi. So my question is, what are your flight suits like compared to other suits you have seen or worn as military test pilots or in astronaut training? Uh, the space suits that we wear on Crew Dragon are uh, similar in what they're designed to do as other pressure suits uh, in case there's a, a hull breach or a loss of uh, pressurization within the vehicle. These suits would pressurize and keep us safe. Um, they're very unique relative to the suits that we've, we've tried before uh, or worn before. Shuttle, we wore the uh, ACES suit, which was uh, the, the larger orange suit. It was quite a bit more bulky, and it was kind of sized generically rather than these particular suits for SpaceX. Uh, they're, they're custom sized to the individual. And uh, obviously, I think a lot of people think they are really neat looking suits, uh, and they uh, do the job. Uh, one thing I would say is SpaceX uh, designed and built and developed these suits from the ground up, uh, which is unique. Um, usually there's a separate company or companies involved that make these spacesuits, and so it was really neat to be uh, there from the very beginning of the development of these suits to the, to the two suits that we just tried on this morning uh, to just check them one more time before we get ready to go fly. Now we'll go to Rachel Joy from Florida Today. Hi, there's a bit of a delay, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'm Florida Today is the is the local paper here on the Space Coast, and I can tell you that our readers are just so excited and proud that you're here. 
and, and would love to know a little bit more about what your plans are this weekend for Memorial Day. I know it's a little weird. You're in quarantine. And, and maybe if you could reveal some of your, your local favorite spots around town. I don't know if there's restaurants or beaches you go to when you are able to get out. <laughs> well, I'll take at least part of that question. Uh-oh, we lost the screen. Are you guys still there? Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> Okay, yeah, our, our screen locked up there for a second. Okay, uh, the video is still locked up, but it sounds like you can hear us. Um, yeah, so for uh, the weekend, we, um, I think we're good now, Brandon. For the weekend, we're, uh, uh, we're following the schedule. Um, we're still in quarantine. Um, so yeah, it'll be a uh, unique Memorial Day uh, weekend for us um, being in quarantine. The good thing is, is our families, uh, arrive uh, tomorrow, so we'll get to see them. Um, but there's just continuing schedule. For example, tomorrow is the dry dress, so that'll be kind of the dress rehearsal for uh, launch day. And then Sunday and Monday, we have uh, plenty of scheduled events as we work our way towards launch on Wednesday. So um, the, the long and the short of it is, is it's a little bit of uh, what we like to call Groundhog Day, which is quarantine. Um, but uh, there's plenty of things to do, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to be outside, maybe get out to the uh, beach house and at least enjoy uh, kind of some of the traditional things that folks will enjoy or hope to enjoy on most Memorial Days. And as far as uh, I think your other question was the uh, where do we like to go when we can get out, um, pretty much anywhere, uh, anywhere in Cocoa Beach, uh, it's always just neat to to, to get out and see the beach and some of the different restaurants and places that we, we try to go whenever we get down here. But uh, the docks will not allow it on this trip. Yeah, no, I get you. So we won't be seeing you at the sand bar this time. No, probably not, unfortunately. But we'd, we'd certainly like to say hi to everybody there, if there is anybody there. That's the other thing. I don't even know if it's – are they are those places open to some degree in a limited fashion or or not at all? All right, next up we'll go to Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, first of all, uh, can you, I know you have a manual flying demonstration during your transit to the space station. Can you talk about which of you is actually going to be flying the vehicle and your roles during during the flight up to ISS your, uh, for each of you? And also, you were both selected as astronauts in 2000, uh, sort of in the heart of the shuttle program. Did you ever expect to be flying anything in space besides the shuttle when you joined the astronaut office? Thanks. Uh, for the manual flying, I'll be doing the manual flying uh, as the Dragon Commander, and uh, we will do a manual flying demo uh, in free flight, um, and then we'll do another one when we get uh, closer to the ISS. And, you know, it's a it, it's certainly the, those, those tests are kind of two-person tests for sure because there's a lot of back and forth between Bob and I, and, and you know, we practice that quite a bit. And, it, and it's obviously something that we want to make sure we understand completely for future crews in case they ever have to fly the vehicle manually. Um, as far as the second question, um, you know, I think both of us would really have been – just over the moon if we had the opportunity when we first arrived to fly on a new spacecraft. And uh, over the years, you know, we've seen NASA uh, complete the space station and then consider what the next steps were going to be. And so we've longed to be a part of a, a test mission, a test space flight, and Doug and I are lucky enough to get that opportunity going forward. So I would say it's something we maybe dreamed about when we were new ASCANs, flying something other than the space shuttle, the next vehicle. It did not seem likely uh, at the time when when we uh, arrived in the astronaut office, there was a, a, a lot of assembly of the International Space Station that had to happen, and so we needed to get through that, and we were just uh, excited to have our opportunities on those missions, um, and that, that happened many years ago. So I think we're, we're, uh, we are, we're living the dream is what uh, I guess astronaut Michael, Michael Fossum would have said if he was that posed with that question. Okay, next we're going to go to Dave Mosher with Business Insider. Uh, thank you guys for doing this, and uh, best of luck on your flight. Um, so you both said this is an experimental flight and, and basically an astronaut's dream to do uh, a test flight, but it, there's still a, a good amount of risk in it. And I'm curious if, if and how mission management has shared 
LOC or LOM numbers with you and, you know, what you think about those numbers, how, how confident you are uh, moving forward with, with the test flight. Thank you. I think whenever we, we hear those numbers, we, we dig a little bit deeper than just what the overall, you know, statistics might, might imply. And those numbers are best used as you kind of compare different ways of doing things or hardware changes that you might pursue or otherwise. Uh, we've had full information, I think, from the commercial crew program, uh, from the SpaceX team as we've gone forward with this. And so I think we've had the luxury over the last five plus years to be deeply embedded in and understanding of the, the trades that were made. And, and, and as you, as you probably understand, there's, there are often cases where a hardware change can be implemented or there can be an operational change that uh, reduces that risk or manages it in some way. And so we've been deeply involved in that entire process. And so uh, we did even get a chance over the last two days uh, to duck our heads into the agency's uh, flight readiness review and, and hear the discussions that the management teams were having uh, about the overall risk or, or different ways of doing business with this mission itself. And so I think we're really comfortable with it. And, and you know, we, we think that those trades have been made appropriately. And, and as far as insight goes, we've had uh, probably more than, than any crew has uh, uh, in recent history, just in terms of understanding the, the, the different scenarios that are on our plate. Yeah, those, those numbers are, are certainly part of the equation when you assess risk, but they're certainly not exclusive by any stretch of the imagination. They change based on a lot of different design changes or just statistics as we move forward in a program. So they're certainly a factor, but there's just so much more to assessing risk and, and all those things that you need to, you know, put into the decision matrix before you go fly. But uh, anyway. I think one of the really unique things about the, the Dragon vehicle is the, the legacy that they have with cargo. So they have the, the team has that experience as well as the uh, Falcon 9 rocket that has uh, what wasn't a long history when we started this program, but has uh, kind of panned out and to be uh, quite a number of flights under its belt and its evolution has become more and more safe as it's been operated. And that's something that we really do appreciate and, and it's just remarkable to see all the other missions that have contributed to the human spaceflight program by, you know, in some sense being a test mission for us before we had the chance to fly on the Falcon 9. Thank you. Okay, I think that is all the time we have for questions, unfortunately. I apologize for those that we didn't get to, but uh, since this is our last time to talk with Bob and Doug before we see them uh, next week, we want to wish them luck, let them know we'll be cheering them on. And for those on the phone, you will need to hang up and dial into the next briefing. That's coming up here on NASA TV at uh, 2.45, and will be the post-flight readiness review briefing. Again, uh, we'll see you all back here on launch day, May 27th. Thanks.